Hi, I'm Autumn Casiglia, and I'm the Adult Ministry Director here at Faith and a counselor with over 20 years experience. And I get to talk to you today about the spiritual weapons we have in guarding our mental health. We all want to replace our anxiety with peace and our depression with joy. But here on earth, we have a struggle to do that, right? Our physical health and our mental health can spiral downward when we don't do the things that are healthy for us. There are physical weapons that we have and tools like getting enough sleep, eating right, treating chemical and vitamin deficiencies, and there are emotional and relational tools like learning to resolve conflict, communicate, and being present with the ones we love. And in addition to that, there are spiritual weapons that God gives us to guard our mental health. Ephesians 6.12 says it like this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual for forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we know that there's a spiritual battle, and so there have to be some spiritual weapons. And so we can look to 2 Corinthians to hear about those weapons. As the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. To demolish strongholds, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So how do we find victory in this struggle and take our thoughts captive? And we see that Jesus took every thought captive in Matthew 4. So right before Matthew 4, where Jesus is led into the desert and is tempted by Satan, God the Father actually says who Jesus is. He actually says, this is my son in whom I well am well pleased. Now, a modern day translation of that is, this is my kid and I'm super duper proud of him. So we know Jesus' identity is he is a child of God. So we know he's fully God and fully man and he is God's child. And this is what God is saying to us. That's our identity too, guys. So Satan tempts us and tests us and he does this just like he did with Jesus. And when Jesus is brought into the desert and he is tempted, one of the reasons he's brought there is so we can learn how to take every thought captive. So Satan accuses him and he says, if you're really the son of man, if you're really the son of God, then do this. And Jesus says, it is written. So he comes back to Satan with the word of God. And every time Satan accuses him, Jesus responds with the word of God. He says, it is written, Worship the Lord your God alone, serve him only. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, man will not live by bread alone. And that's for us, so we know where our weapons found is in the word of God. The word of God is how we find our weapon to come against the accusations of Satan that we're not really the child of God and God doesn't really love us. So just like Jesus, oftentimes when we're tested, we think, does God really care about me? Or am I being punished? Or am I really his child? And we just want to go back and see if Jesus could be tested this way and face troubles in this life, then we too are going to be tested. And we don't want to be surprised by this test. It is going to come. And we can trust that God is still our good, good father and he loves us very, very much. So what are the lies that the enemy is saying to you about who you are and about who God is and about what your future is going to look like? Take those thoughts captive by speaking the word of God out loud. By saying it out loud, you will believe it more and you will renew your mind. I wonder today what you're feeding your hearts and souls with. Because right now we have access to 24-7 news. We can listen to bad news all day, every day, if we want to. And I'm wondering what it would be like if we balance some of that bad news with good news. In my life, when I'm anxious, I tend to procrastinate. I tend to avoid the things that are scary to me. And I know as a counselor, as a psychologist, when I avoid anxiety, it actually gets bigger. The little mountain, the little hill turns into a big mountain, turns into a big task, and it gets bigger and bigger as I avoid it and procrastinate. When I was a teenager, I was taken over by social anxiety. I cannot believe the difference in who I am today 
compared to who I was then. As a teenager, I would peel the skin on my thumbs raw. And if I was asked a question directly, I would freeze up. Honestly, today, the people that know me would not recognize me as a teenager. So how did I find healing? I will tell you, it was in 2 Timothy 1.7. I found that verse in 11th grade and I read it and I meditated on it and I definitely ate it like food. And it says this, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power and love and a strong mind. And so when I read this, I got angry. I realized, okay, this fear then, it's not from God, so it's from the enemy. And I realized I was fighting the enemy of my soul. And I realized there were tools that I was given, and that was power and love and a strong mind. And as I faced the fears that were coming up in my life, and I went across the hills, they became hills instead of mountains. And slowly I realized that God was with me as I went through those things, and he was giving me strength along the way. And then again, when I was a young mom, anxiety crept in. I was so frustrated. It was a friend that I didn't want to hang out with. It was definitely a friend of me. But again, I was sleep deprived. I was tired. I probably wasn't eating right. And so the words that came through my mind were often, I'm so tired. This is so hard. I can't do this. And when I started to realize what I was feeding my heart, my mind, my soul on, which were words that were not the words of God, I started replacing those words and putting in in place, I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as I meditated on that, I actually had more energy at the end of the day. So one of the tools I give to my clients is to say, at the end of a negative thought, and that's the way I want it. So if I've replaced my thought when I was a young mom with, I can't do this, this is too hard, I'm so tired, and that's the way I want it, immediately I'm faced with a choice. Okay, well, that is not the way I want it. So now I have to choose, am I gonna change how I'm managing my life? Am I gonna ask for help for a night of sleep that is uninterrupted? And am I gonna change my thoughts so I'm not meditating on how hard it is every day, but actually thinking about the one who gives me strength? And so if you can use that tool and maybe help you to kind of snap yourself out of those negative thoughts and those negative thought spirals, maybe it'll help you too to say, ooh, I better replace my thoughts with God's truth. Our words are powerful. They create the inner world of our heart, our minds, and our spirit. They either move us towards our good, good father or away from him. And they move us towards people or away from them. And that's why we wanna capture our thoughts for Christ. Are your thoughts drawing you towards people and towards God or away from him and away from them? If you think he's giving you strength for the things that are hard in your life, then you will lean into your relationship with him. If you know that he's with you and he cares for you, then you will rely on him. C.S. Lewis says it this way, some people feel guilty about their anxieties and regard them as a defect of faith. I don't agree at all. They are afflictions, not sins. And like all afflictions, they are, if we can so take them, our share in the passion of Christ. So if Jesus knows about our afflictions, if he knows about our stresses, our worries, our troubles, isn't he the best friend we could ever have? And the one that has taken all that on himself to show that love for us. So we can lean into our relationship with him. We can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We can rely on the promises of God because he is our good, good father. And that is really, really good news. So here are a few promises to hold on to when things get rough. Maybe you're looking at the culture and you're looking around and you're worried about your kids and your grandkids. And here is a verse that I hold on to when I feel that worry. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So he's telling us don't lose heart. 
I actually went to the cross for your kids, for your grandkids. I love them more than you ever could. So when you're tempted to worry, trust in me because I have them in the palm of my hand. I love them and I'm not going to drop them. So maybe you're worried about money and how you're gonna provide through this pandemic. And I certainly understand those worries too. Um, Hebrews 13 says it this way, keep your lives free from the love of money and the focus of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So we have confidence. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. So maybe you're worried about your health or your children's health. And this is a really hard one. It's certainly one that I had to face. And I had to memorize Isaiah 41, 9 to 10. And it says, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I have not dropped you. And I will go before you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Maybe you are actually afraid of fear and anxiety. It's become its own kind of fear. The fear of having a panic attack or the fear of being anxious and not being able to sleep. In Isaiah 26, 3, it talks about this fear. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. And it doesn't mean it's going to take everything away, but as you meditate on those verses, hopefully it'll bring some peace and some comfort to know that we can focus on how big our God is, how loving our good God is, and that he's with us and we're not alone in whatever fear, affliction, or challenge we face. He's with us to face all of it, and we're never, never, ever alone. The Bible says over 300 times, do not be afraid. In many different ways, he says, do not be discouraged, do not be dismayed. 300 times this topic is brought up. This isn't to shame us. This is because he knows we are going to face fearful things in this world, and he wants to go with us through those fearful things. He wants us to know that we can rely on his promises and his word. We can elevate our perspective to focus on him instead of our circumstances. We can pray and we can count our blessings and be thankful. And in that, we can find strength in him. And that is our weapon. When we take every thought captive and we bring it to God as a prayer or we renew our minds with his word and his promises, we are given strength to come against the enemy's lies and to renew our minds. So research shows that meditation and prayer actually changes the pathways in our brains. So what if we were more intentional with what we consumed? We think about what we consume physically, but are we thinking about what we consume spiritually? What if we actually read our Bibles more than we watch Netflix? What if we actually memorize some of God's promises instead of scrolling so much through Instagram? And if we replace some of our habits with new healthier habits spiritually, maybe we'd see a difference in our mental health. If you've liked our conversation today, you can like and subscribe to hear more mental health videos. Also, there's a link in our description to go to our website and get more mental health resources. Have a great day.